Hi friends, so uh, by looking at the title of this video, you would have already known this, that this video is about cardiac tamponade. However, I would like to start with a case scenario rather than the conventional way uh, we usually start our lectures with. And uh, this is a 48 year old gentleman who presents to you with complaints of uh, giddiness and uh, on examination, you uh, notice that the patient has raised JVP, patient is clammy, patient's heart rate is 125 per minute, blood pressure is 80 by 40. Uh, on auscultation, the chest is clear and uh, on detailed history, uh, you get a history of long-standing alcohol intake, but nothing, nothing really exciting apart from that. So, uh, you order a chest x-ray, ECG and various other blood tests. Uh, the ECG does not show anything, it shows sinus tachycardia, the X-ray shows uh, this finding and uh, it looks like a cardiomegaly or a globular uh, heart and you ask for an echo at the bedside and the echo shows the following finding. Now did you see the echo? Uh, what do you feel uh, is the finding in the echo? Uh, definitely there is some fluid collection around the heart. Uh, you can see that the, there is collapse of a chamber. Uh, could you identify which view is this? Uh, this is a rather a subcostal uh, view and what you are seeing here is the uh, uh, right ventricular systolic collapse uh, in, the, in the echo. And uh, the, the next question logically would be, is this pericardia, uh, pericardial effusion uh, leading to cardiac tamponade or it's just the pericardial effusion and incidental finding? And uh, we will discuss that in the uh, following uh, lecture and let us hope that you get your concepts get more clear about it. So when do you say that the cardiac effusion has, pericardiac effusion has turned into cardiac tamponade? And that happens when the uh, intrapericardial pressure exceeds the CVP. Now, what do I mean by that? So, CVP is basically your filling pressure. So, whatever the CVP may be, normal value is uh, 0 to 5. And the CVP, and that's the pressure in the superior vena cava. And the pressure in the right atrium, they are the same. So, basically, uh, since it is kind of negative, uh, the blood comes into the right uh, atrium and then it is forwarded uh, as the part of cardiac cycle. You, you know that already. But uh, when there is uh, uh, fluid surrounding the heart into the pericardium, it generates, it, it exerts some pressure on the heart. And when this pressure is more than the CVP, then it becomes very difficult for the fluid from the systemic venous return to enter the heart and the heart does not fill properly. Uh, so, and, and as you know, the normal uh, RA pressure is 0 to 5, normal RV pressure goes up, uh, so that's around uh, uh, 25 by 0, then pulmonary artery pressure is uh, almost the same, but the diastolic element is added, so that's around 25 by 15 and like that. But when there is fluid surrounding the heart and the pressure goes above the CVP, it uh, in a way it is above the CVP, so the if you try and put a... a uh, central venous line and try and measure the pressure in the right atrium it will be not the cvp but it will be rather the outside pressure and as the outside pressure builds up it goes even above the right ventricular pressure and the pa pressure and you get only one pressure and uh, that is the pericardial pressure but uh, you may not know that at that point but if you see the equalization of pressure that means the ra rv and pa pressures are all the same that is a sign that uh, it's not their individual uh, pressure of those chambers. It is the outside pressure which is much higher than the individual pressures. And that's why you are uh, seeing that outside pressure which is the pericardial pressure. And this patient has tamponade. So equalization of pressures is one of the important signs if you have a PA catheter uh, that this patient, a particular patient has cardiac tamponade. Uh, equalization of pressure also means that the uh, there is very difficulty in uh, the venous return and uh, there is no filling so there is no forward output and this leads to uh, low right ventricular output low left ventricular output and uh, hypotension this eventually leads to shock uh, now if this uh, process happens over a short time as we discussed this leads to shock if this process happens over a long time 
uh, then the body the patient's body gets more time to adjust to this so patient might drink more water try to bring up their cvp uh, higher than the uh, pericardial pressure and facilitate the cardiac feeling uh, so to some extent this is helpful but eventually that is also overcome by the pericardial pressure and this patient again presents into the shock but since it took longer period than the acute scenario uh, in this situation when there is subacute or chronic presentation these patients would have engorged jvp engorged liver hepatomegaly and peripheral edema which are signs of right heart failure uh, traditionally so uh, this is a that is a little difference in the presentation another important point to remember is uh, it is the uh, pericardial pressure and not the pericardial volume which is responsible for tamponade so if the process is slow and uh, gradual over weeks or months the volume of the pericardial fluid may be too much but the patient may not be in tamponade uh, contrary to that if the process happens over few minutes or hours the volume may not be too much but uh, within a small volume the pressure might be significant to uh, be above the uh, cvp and uh, lead to tamponade so it is rather the pericardial pressure and not the pericardial volume which is responsible for tamponade now uh, coming to the to the patient that we discussed would you give diuretic to, to this patient this could very well be heart failure and uh, diuretics are the treatment of choice uh, but here the important finding is which is different from heart failure is clear chest and uh, in heart failure or pulmonary edema patient would have uh, crepitations or wheezing and that would clinch the diagnosis in favor of heart failure acute pulmonary edema while here the chest is clear although the patient has raised jvp and hypotension uh, this is not uh, a heart failure so diuretics are not indicated in this case if you give diuretics they would rather bring down the cvp and even if your patient is not in tamponade to begin with uh, he or she will go into tamponade when you make them uh, hypovolemic so please remember that uh, diuretics are not to be given if you are suspecting cardiac tamponade now uh, we will discuss various causes of cardiac tamponade and uh, uh, we will uh, divide them into acute and uh, less acute so acute include uh, any kind of trauma generally the presentation is with polytrauma or penetrating injury or something like that and uh, the patient may be receiving a lot of fluids as a part of your resuscitation strategy you feel that the cvp is coming up but still the patient's shock is not improving so then at that point you have to think that whether this patient has cardiac tamponade and this is because the, your cvp is still not uh, high enough to go above the pericardial pressure and that's why your patient's blood pressure is not improving other acute causes include immediate post cardiac surgery patients who might have bled into the pericardium uh, patients uh, who undergo any cardiac interventions uh, so this this include uh, cardiac catheterization radio frequency ablation pacemaker insertion there could be some injury to coronaries or there could be perforation in the one of the chambers of the heart and this might lead to collection of blood uh, in the pericardial cavity and within a day or two they may present in tamponade so that's also a, a possibility uh, another uh, possibility is uh, dressler syndrome or post myocardial infarction uh, pericarditis and that is also that can also present with tamponade and uh, probably one more to discuss is a rupture of the uh, cardiac chamber or rupture of the aorta which may lead to collection of the blood in pericardial cavity however in this situation if you put a drain uh, it's not going to help rather it will uh, help the patient bleed more and bleed early to death so if there is a suspicion of rupture of aorta or rupture of cardiac chamber the treatment of choice there would be uh, surgical rather than uh, putting a drain so these were the acute causes now uh, there are certain causes which are subacute or chronic and these include infective causes which may uh, be viral myocarditis any bacterial infections tubercular pericarditis fungal infections it could be malignancies so uh, these include uh, malignancies of lung breast esophagus lymphomas leukemias uh, malignancies in, involving liver and pancreas these all can uh, present in with the uh, pericardial effusion and tamponade uh, it could be a connective tissue disorder like uh, rheumatic uh, arthritis rheumatoid arthritis uh, ankyl ankylosing spondylitis sle uh, they all acute rheumatic fever they all can present with uh, 
pericardial effusion and tamponade. Uh, it could also be uh, endocrine like uh, hypothyroidism uh, and uh, drugs, various drugs like procainamide, phenytoin, uh, isoniazid, uh, minoxidil. Uh, they all can, as a patients on anticoagulation, they all can present with uh, cardiac tamponade. Uh, also, you have to remember that uh, long-standing uremic patients, uh, patients in congestive heart failure uh, can also present with tamponade. Uh, acute radiation therapy can lead to uh, pericardial collection and tamponade. Uh, Post-cardiotomy also uh, patient can present like that. So these are the basically the various causes. Now, uh, since we are suspecting this patient to be having tamponade and we have done the echo, uh, there would be certain signs which will clinch the diagnosis for us. And uh, in this case, uh, as you are able to see right ventricular systolic collapse, uh, you will normally see right ventricular and right atrial systolic collapse. Uh, you will see plethora of IVC because of the uh, uh, venous return not being able to enter the heart. So there would be distended uh, JVP as well as distended IVC. However, the most important sign to remember is diastolic collapse of the right ventricular free wall. Uh, so if I want to explain it to you simply, uh, in diastole the right ventricle has to expand and uh, fill with the new uh, blood to push it forward. And when it fails to expand during the diastole because of the pressure outside, uh, the cardiac feeling gets compromised. Uh, the systolic collapse is also one of the signs but it is not very specific because still in the diastole it is the, the chambers are expanding, the right sided chambers are expanding and filling to some extent. But if there is diastolic collapse of the right ventricle that is a very important sign to remember. So that's about the uh, signs in the echo. Now if your echo is showing uh, signs suggestive of uh, cardiac tamponade and your patient has a high pretest probability of uh, having cardiac tamponade. Next thing that you need to uh, look for is uh, uh, pulses paradoxus and uh, pulses paradoxus is typically uh, exaggeration of a normal physiological finding. Uh, when we take a deep inspiration, there is drop in the systolic blood pressure. When he take a deep, we take a deep expiration, there is little rise in the systolic blood pressure. That is a normal physiological response. Why does this happen? So if you look at this, uh, this uh, figure, you know that uh, when you take deep inspiration, the intrathoracic pressure becomes more negative. There is more entry of the blood into the right uh, side of the heart. Uh, this improves the right sided uh, feeling. And because of that, the interventricular septum is pushed towards the uh, left ventricle and this leads to drop in the left ventricular output because of uh, pushing of the septum to the left side, decreased filling of the left ventricle and decreased left ventricular output. So when you monitor blood pressure, which is a reflector of left ventricular output, uh, there will be drop in the blood pressure at the end of deep inspiration and when you exhale the reverse happens and there is improvement in the blood pressure in the uh, because of the left ventricle output improves and uh, that's a normal physiological response this this uh, movement of septum and ventricles helping each other is uh, known as ventricular interdependence and uh, we have discussed that in one of our videos on uh, right-sided heart failure uh, so uh, you can see uh, these uh, images which I have taken from this article from JAMA and uh, I am sharing the uh, article also here for you to refer. Now if the patient uh, say has a cardiac tamponade, the same uh, physiological mechanism is exaggerated and there is a marked drop in the blood pressure at the end of inspiration and there is uh, elevation in the blood pressure at the end of expiration and this difference is more than 10 millimeters of mercury then it is significant and uh, you can uh, correlate it with the possibility of cardiac tamponade and be almost certain that about your diagnosis. Now uh, that's all fine and that's very uh, easy to explain but why it is called pulses paradoxus that is very there is very interesting history behind it and uh, uh, this uh, pulses paradoxus was rather term was coined by Adolf Kussmaul uh, one of the physicians uh, and this was in 1873 and uh, Adolf Kussmaul in that time they did not have sphygmomanometers they could not measure the blood pressure so normal understanding was as per the Bainbridge reflex, if there is a drop in the blood pressure, there is tachycardia. And uh, as we discussed uh, during inspiration, there would be drop in the blood pressure and 
there would be tachycardia since there was no blood pressure measurement at that time what they could only observe with the palpation of pulse was that whether there is tachycardia or bradycardia what is the quality of the pulse volume tone volume and various other aspects and based on that they would uh, describe the patient's cardiovascular findings so if they are say uh, monitoring the pulse by palpation and ask the patient to inhale uh, the patient would have tachycardia but because of the hypotension the pulse would not be palpable and uh, they would feel that the pulse is gone and uh, that would be rather opposite to what they would expect they would expect patient to have tachycardia here they, they could not palpate any pulse and they would feel that the pulse is either there is bradycardia or there is asystole and that's how the term paradoxical uh, comes into uh, play and it was called pulses paradoxes but there is actually nothing paradoxical in that it's uh, an exaggeration of the physiological response now uh, we now i hope you are very clear about it now there are certain other conditions also where you would see pulses paradoxes and uh, these conditions include uh, copd chronic bronchitis as uh, emphysema uh, cases of pulmonary embolism strider they are uh, various cases where patient uh, sometimes in pneumothorax so if patient is trying to take a deep inspiration and excessive effort which might lead to significant drop in the intrathoracic pressure uh, that might lead to significant drop in systolic BP, uh, which is same as pulses paradoxes. But in uh, these situations that I mentioned, the pretest probability of those patients having a pulmonary embolism is very low. So you have to remember that and uh, you have to, uh, accordingly, you have to uh, come to your diagnosis. Now, there are also certain conditions where pulses paradoxes uh, can be rather suppressed or there, there, should, there would not be a difference of more than 10 milliliters of mercury and which are these conditions so these are the conditions like say positive pressure ventilation so instead of negative pressure you are giving positive pressure so the effect would be rather opposite and you would not get any pulses paradoxes if the patient has significant AR uh, during the ventricular diastole a uh, lot of blood comes back from the aortic valve and uh, it helps uh, LV uh, fill to a good volume and the septum is pushed back towards the RV so ventricular interdependence does not uh, uh, play a very good role here and you may not see pulses paradoxes if the patient has ASD then there will be equalization of pressures in the atria and eventually ventricles and there will be no pulses paradoxes if there is severe LV dysfunction or severe LV hypertrophy uh, say in hypertrophy the septum will be will not be able to go towards the LV and uh, LV size will remain good and blood pressure would not drop. Systole in case of LV dysfunction uh, the stroke volume is very little and you cannot demonstrate really good difference in the blood pressure. Uh, now if the patient has a significant dehydration so this could be related to ongoing bleeding, dialysis or by mistake somebody has given diuretics to these patients then the blood volume circulating blood volume will be less and uh, in that case also the the differences in the uh, drop and rise in the blood pressure are not marked uh, to the extent that they will be called pulses paradoxes so you have to be aware of these uh, situations where you may not get a classical pulses paradoxes now uh, once you have confirmed your diagnosis that this patient has uh, cardiac tamponade the next thing to do is pericardiosynthesis uh, you have to make the patient lie supine uh, then elevate the head into 30 degree uh, take help of the echo or ultrasound and uh, it is done from the uh, just below the ziff sternum and uh, you put a needle into the pericardial space and uh, pass a catheter and uh, drain the fluid so that's how you generally do it uh, there is a high risk that you puncture the right ventricle or right atrium uh, because uh, you might in inadvertently injure the heart and you may get bloody blood like discharge uh, so uh, how do you differentiate so probably the first response would be to just take out your needle if and attempt it again with good vision and more control if you still get uh, sanguineous or blood discharge uh, probably use two ml saline uh, shake it uh, shake the syringe well uh, create small bubbles and inject it into the uh, needle and uh, with echo probe uh, see where the bubbles are found whether it is within the heart or whether it is outside the heart and you will know whether you are inside or not uh, other test simple test to do is to collect the blood in two or three uh, tubes and see if it is clotting uh, if the blood is clotting that is that means it is from within the heart 
if it is not clotting it is most likely to be from the pericardial space so these are uh, various ways to know whether you are in the heart or not uh, other important thing to remember while you do pericardial synthesis is not to drain a large volume at once so generally you would drain 250 mils and helicots of that and give a break of say half an hour or one hour within every aspiration and this is because you may put a catheter and just uh, open the uh, three way and drain it you may not have to puncture every time but why this uh, this is because if you uh, remove all the fluid at once uh, there would be sudden improvement in the right ventricular filling and that could lead to sudden pulmonary edema which will be opposite to what uh, you are expecting <coughs> so to prevent that from happening it is a good practice to do uh, pericardial synthesis in small helicots now so if your uh, pericardial synthesis fluid is sanguineous or blood like it could be because of traumatic collection in the pericardium it could be post cardiac surgery post cardiac catheterization or any intervention it could be related to anticoagulation uremia or malignancy if it is purulent it could be infective uh, if it is serous uh, it could be related to congestive heart failure or it could be uh, related to acute radiation therapy uh, if the fluid is uh, uh, say gold paint like or turbulent then this could be tuberculosis or mixed edema uh, uh, so these are the causes if it is chylus uh, it could be actually chyle and there could be a fistulous connection between the pericardial sac and the thoracic duct so you have to be aware what what are the possibilities when you put a needle into pericardial space you would obviously send the fluid for analysis cytology cell counts cultures uh, and various other investigations to to come to your diagnosis so that's that's a given uh, so that's that's all about pericardial effusion now coming to our patient uh, that we were having in the beginning of this uh, discussion and uh, our patient as you could see uh, had a, a diastolic collapse not a sorry systolic collapse not a diastolic collapse of the right ventricle and uh, the patient did have a background of chronic heart failure so even if the chest was not showing a good crepes, the echo, uh, subsequent echoes uh, showed improvement with the diuretic therapy uh, and the patient did well and after a week or so, uh, he was discharged to the, uh, to our, out of the ICU. So you have to remember that it is not always tamponade and you have to look for specific signs. Uh, another thing which I missed in the initial discussion is uh, with the pulse oximetry plethysmography also you can see pulses paradoxes you may not need an arterial line all the time and our patient uh, did not have any uh, pulses paradoxes our patient when we put an arterial line also did not show any pulses paradoxes and that's how we ruled out the possibility of tamponade however we had it in our mind and when we gave diuretic therapy we had a fear that probably we could precipitate tamponade if it is just an effusion but uh, patient's bnp was very high and uh, gradually uh, we repeated the echo every day and gradually we noted that the pericardial fluid is coming down and the patient was eventually discharged so this was about uh, cardiac tamponade and i hope you liked this video uh, till we meet in the next video uh, it's goodbye from my side so this was about uh, cardiac tamponade and i hope you liked this video uh, till we meet in the next video uh, it's goodbye from my side